Okay, so uh, let's get started with uh, the third and last installment of Raj Chetty's uh, Lionel Robbins lecture. Since by now you will already have been introduced to Raj, I'm not going to uh, give you a long um, uh, speech, but essentially just uh, give the podium to, to Raj. So he will speak today about upward mobility, innovation, and economic growth. And after Raj's lecture, there'll be time for questions as in the other lectures. Thanks, Henrik. All right, uh, so I'm going to talk today about uh, mobility, innovation, and economic growth. And you'll recall that where we uh, left off at the end of the last lecture was talking about policies to improve equality of opportunity. Uh, and that policy focus on improving equality of opportunity, I think, is typically motivated by concerns about justice and equity, the idea that everyone should have a shot at success or a shot at the American dream, no matter their family background. But stepping back from that objective, I think the desirability of greater equality of opportunity also depends upon impacts on aggregate output or on, on total efficiency. Uh, so to, to put it differently, I think a key question that we need to address before thinking about whether from a normative perspective it actually makes sense to try to increase equality of opportunity through whatever policy tools we have is to um, figure out whether increasing opportunities for low-income kids, which is what we've been focused on, harms kids from higher-income families. Now, that, of course, has to be mechanically true in terms of the way we've been talking about opportunity in the past couple of lectures, which is in terms of percentile ranks. If somebody goes up in the income distribution in ranks, somebody else has obviously got to come down. But I think, more importantly, I think the right way to think about it is in terms of absolute dollars. Of course, when you think in absolute dollars, there's no mathematical requirement that if you know, one person earns more in dollars, somebody else has to earn less. And so when I talk about uh, opportunity in this lecture, I want to think about it in these absolute terms and assess whether there's a trade-off between equality of opportunity and uh, efficiency. So in general, there are many reasons to think we might face an equity efficiency trade-off, even in the context of, of improving equality of opportunity. So for example, um, suppose ability and resources are complements. And in addition, suppose, as I think is plausible, uh, that higher income children, children from higher income families, have higher ability on average because there's some transmission of genetics um, across generations, right? So ability is persistent. So in this case, uh, equalizing opportunity by spreading resources, for instance, the quality of schools equally across all families will reduce total output, right? Because in a situation where ability and resources are complements, that is, giving somebody a higher quality school has a bigger payoff in terms of total output if that person has high ability to begin with, then you want to allocate your resources and schools to the people with highest levels of ability which in this case is going to be the kids who have uh, the highest family incomes to begin with. And so that's actually going to tilt against wanting equality of opportunity. Inequality in opportunity will maximize output in that scenario. So in this sort of situation where there's a tension between equality of opportunity from a justice perspective and the goal of maximizing aggregate output from an efficiency perspective, the optimal policy is, of course, going to depend upon the social welfare function. It's going to depend upon the relative weight that we place on justice and aggregate efficiency. Now, so that's a scenario where you know, it's not totally clear uh, what the optimal policy will be in terms of uh, trying to affect equality of opportunity. It's going to depend upon what our uh, social preferences are. However, a sufficient condition for desirability of greater equality of opportunity is a situation where increasing equality of opportunity also happens to increase efficiency and economic growth. Uh, so in that, if you know, that happens to be the case, if we find policies that do this, then we're both going to have both greater equity and greater output, and hence, you know, unambiguously, greater welfare. And so that's the kind of situation I'm going to be interested in thinking about today. But more broadly, we're going to want to you know, I think the, the question we're interested in is assessing whether greater equality of opportunity comes at the expense of lower growth rates or lower total GDP, or does it perhaps even go, you know, go in the opposite direction? So 
empirically, it's very difficult to measure the effects of changing equality of opportunity on aggregate growth directly, right? That's just an empirically challenging problem because measuring impacts on total growth, there are lots of different mechanisms uh, and identification is, is quite complicated. So instead, I'm gonna uh, tackle a much narrower question here, which is to focus on one particular driver of growth uh, innovation. So I think many people, a lot of recent economic theory, suggests that innovation is one of the key drivers of economic growth. And by looking at innovation, we'll be able to, from a microeconomic perspective, get a much more granular sense of how changing a quality of opportunity might affect innovation and thereby, based on prior uh, theory, ultimately affect economic growth. So I'm going to divide this lecture into two parts. I'm going to first talk about uh, equality of opportunity and effects on innovation from a positive perspective and show you empirically what we find in the data. And then I'll spend a little bit of time at the end talking about policies to increase innovation in light of what we see in the data. What I'm gonna present is based primarily on a paper uh, with John Manrinen and other co-authors called The Life Cycle of Inventors. So let's start by talking about equality of opportunity and innovation. I'll start by telling you how we measure innovation in the data. So we're going to measure innovation using patents, which is a standard proxy for invention in the literature with well-known pros and cons. We think patenting is highly correlated with having an invention, but it's also not a perfect proxy for invention because some people have important inventions that are not patented, and some patents are not necessarily of great value. They could be defensive patents meant to protect property rights and so forth. So it's not a perfect measure of innovation by any means, but it's often the best measure we have and we think it has quite a bit of empirical content. So what we do is, uh, in the study is we link the universe of patent records in the United States uh, to the tax data that I've been discussing in the previous lectures. Uh, patent records are publicly available. You see people's names on these patents when they file them and we use that information to connect them to the tax data. And using that linked data, we're able to study the lives of 750,000 patent holders in the United States from birth to adulthood. So I'm gonna start by thinking about conditions at birth with this chart here, which shows you patent rates versus parent income. So the way this is constructed is that on the x-axis, we have the parent's household income percentile. There are 100 dots on this graph, one for each percentile of the income distribution. And what we're plotting is the number of kids who go on to become inventors by their mid-30s or so versus their parents' income. So you can see that there's an incredibly strong relationship between your probability of becoming an inventor and your parents' income. If you happen to be born to parents in the top 1% of the income distribution, you're about 10 times as likely to have a patent as if you happen to be born to parents below the median of the income distribution. Now, this relationship is true not just for patents overall. And, you, know, you might worry that uh, some of these patents are not all that important. You know, maybe when we look at really important patents, the ones that have the biggest impact, perhaps this relationship gets weaker. So that's actually uh, not, not true. So if you look at the fraction of inventors on the right axis here who are in the top 5% of citations, uh, so they have these very highly cited patents. What fraction of people go on to have highly cited patents, uh, which is, you know, citations is a natural measure of the impact of a patent. You can see that that relationship looks almost exactly the same uh, as the raw relationship that I showed you on the previous slide, shown here in the blue dots, right? So even among really impactful patents as measured by citations, you continue to see that kids from high income families are much more likely to have those than kids from lower income families. So why is it that we see this really strong relationship between uh, rates of innovation and parent income? So I think there are three mechanisms that one can think about that, that might be driving the, this correlation. So in any economic model, there are basically three ingredients that drive uh, ultimate outcomes, endowments, preferences, and constraints. And so in this context, uh, you can think of endowments as differences in innate ability. So perhaps the relationship that we were seeing on the previous slide is driven by the fact that children from high income families have higher levels of innate ability because of genetic transmission. Uh, and maybe that's why um, they're much more likely to become inventors. 
A second distinct possibility is that this is about differences in preferences. So maybe lower income kids just prefer to go into other occupations. Perhaps the they have the same levels of ability as high income kids, but rather than taking the risk of going into innovation, which has very uh, stochastic returns, you might be very successful, but you might also not make much money at all. Maybe lower income kids, because they have less money to start with, prefer safer occupations like becoming a doctor or a lawyer, for instance. A third possibility is that this is about constraints. So this is along the lines of what we've been talking about in the previous couple of lectures. Uh, perhaps lower income kids face greater barriers to entry into the innovation sector. Could be, for example, a poorer environment. They go to weaker schools. They live in worse neighborhoods, et cetera, the various issues we've been discussing. Could also be perhaps that they face liquidity constraints. They don't have the capital necessary to become inventors and start businesses and so forth. So these are three very different implications in terms of, uh, th three very different explanations in terms of their policy implications, right? So if it's about endowments, there's really not all that much we can do about that. In fact, as I was saying at the beginning, this could tilt in the opposite direction that you might wanna give more opportunities to these talented high income kids. If it's about preferences, perhaps we'd want to respect those preferences or maybe we'd want to endogenously try to change those preferences to steer more kids into innovation if we think that that's going to have uh, large externalities on the economy as a whole. And if it's constraints, if it is about, say, differences in childhood environment, then we'd want to think about trying to improve equality of opportunity along the lines that we've been discussing in the past couple of lectures. So distinguishing between these three explanations is really critical in understanding the role of equality of opportunity in potentially increasing innovation and, and aggregate growth, and that's what I'm gonna spend much of this lecture on. So let's start by thinking about differences in ability. Do differences in ability explain the innovation gap? So as a first step to answer this question, we're going to measure ability using the test score data that we talked about in the last lecture. Uh, for children who went to New York City public schools. So that uh, data set gives us information on math and English scores from grades three to eight on statewide standardized tests for about 430,000 children uh, in the birth cohorts that we examine here in the, in the early 1980s, okay? And so using that data, uh, we can start to examine differences in ability between kids from low and high income families. Now test scores are an imperfect measure of ability of course, but they're certainly correlated with ability and so the idea here is to use test scores relatively early in childhood when you're in third grade in this case as a rough way to get a sense of how much ability seems to differ between low and high income kids and whether that could explain the innovation gap. So just to start, uh, let's look at this chart here which plots the distribution of test scores for kids in low income, low and middle income families, so parent income below the 80th percentile in the blue, and relatively high income families, families above the 80th percentile in the red. And you can see that it is in fact true in the data that kids from high income families have higher ability on average. The red distribution has shifted to the right relative to the blue. And in particular, uh, if you look at the fraction of kids who have scores in the very upper tail so what fraction of kids have test scores in the top 10% of the test score distribution? Uh, you see that uh, kids from family, relatively high income families are significantly more likely to be in the upper tail of the test score distribution, which we'll see in a second is what's important for predicting innovation relative to kids from low income families. So now these differences in test scores, how much of a difference in innovation uh, do they translate into? So we see that you know, there is at least some difference in ability. It's not like the, uh, these two distributions are identical. So to get a handle on that, uh, we can look at this chart here, which plots the fraction of kids who go on to become inventors versus their third grade math test scores now. So instead of looking at parent income on the x-axis, we're looking at third grade math test scores. And uh, what you can see is that, uh, so the way this is constructed is that each dot represents 5% of the test score distribution, so there are 20 dots here, okay? And what you can see is there's a strong relationship between test scores and the, your probability of becoming an inventor. In particular, if you're below the 90th percentile of your third grade math class, unfortunately your prospects of becoming an inventor don't look all that good. And then the probability really shoots up in the upper tail, 
Uh, now, in, just in, as an aside, why math test scores? It so happens that if you condition on math test scores, English test scores have absolutely no predictive power for whether you become an inventor. So it's all about <laughs> uh, math ability, which is kind of interesting. Um, so, all right, so coming back to now how this relates to, to parent income, let's now split this chart cutting by parent income, right? And so this is what I think is particularly interesting in this context. So we're replicating that analysis of plotting the number of inventors versus their third grade math test scores versus their ability in a sense. Splitting the data into kids, again, from low and middle income families in the blue, parents below the 80th percentile, and kids from relatively rich families in the red. And so what do you see? I think there's a striking pattern here, which is that these high ability kids who are at the top of their third grade math class are much more likely to become inventors if they're from high income families. If you're from a low income family and you're really smart and at the top of your third grade math class, your probability of becoming an inventor doesn't look all that much higher than any of the other kids in the classroom. And so that suggests that not all of the gap in innovation that we're seeing uh, in the raw data between low and high income families can be entirely explained by differences in ability. Because when we condition on ability and focus in on the kids who are doing the best in, in their third grade classes, the kids from high income families have significantly higher propensities to innovate, even conditional on that measure of ability. Now, how much, so that shows you that not all of the difference can be explained by, by ability, right? So quantitatively, how much of the difference in innovation between low and high income families can be explained by differences in test scores. We calculate the differences in third grade test scores account for about 30% of the income gap in innovation. And the way we reach that conclusion is by doing a reweighting exercise where we basically ask what would the rates of innovation of kids from low income families look like if they had exactly the same test scores as kids from high income families. So you can basically ask, if you reweight that distribution to look identical to what you see for high income families, how much higher would the rate of innovation for low income kids look? And the answer is that it would close about 30% of the gap, all right? So, uh, the, so the next question uh, we ask, so that analysis is entirely for children in third grade, right? If low income kids had the same test score distribution as high income kids, the gap in innovation would be about 30% smaller. Now, what I want to ask next is, th that was using third grade test scores. How does that change, that analysis change, if we use test scores in later grades? So in this chart, we're plotting the percent of the gap in innovation explained by test scores, calculated in the way that I explained for third grade, uh, by the grade in which we measure students' test scores. So you can see in third grade, you explain, as I was saying, 31% of the gap. Um, based on differences in test scores at that age. Now, if you redo that analysis in fourth grade, you can see that that number jumps up to something like 36 or 37%, and then it further increases to around 40% by fifth grade, and so forth and so on. So as we use test scores in later and later grades, we see that we explain more and more of the gap in innovation uh, based on differences in student ability. Now, of course, as you're going further forward, uh, these differences in test scores capture not just differences in innate ability, but also differences in the environment in which you're growing up. So the kids in low-income families are going to worse schools, perhaps, or uh, living in, in worse neighborhoods, and that's presumably affecting their test scores. So basically what this is telling you is that low-income kids are falling further and further behind high-income kids over time, and as a result, when we use their test scores at later and later ages, we start to explain more and more of the gap in innovation, which is consistent with the idea that these gaps in innovation are not ex entirely explained by differences in innate ability, but rather uh, explained by differences in ability at the point, say, when you enter the labor market, where if you were to extrapolate this out, say, to the end of high school or you know, right around uh, college entrance, you'd explain virtually all of the gap you know, in innovation by the time you're, say, 20 or so, if you just trace this line out, suggesting that it's these accumulated differences over childhood, you know, exactly consistent with the ideas we were discussing in the previous lectures, that explains much of this gap uh, in innovation. Now, you see analogous results when you look at 
other uh, dimensions of heterogeneity. So I've been focusing on differences in rates of innovation by income uh, until now, and we've been focusing primarily on differences in equality in opportunity by income. But let's look at another dimension that we can look at in these data, which is race. So here you also see very striking differences. So we're plotting inventors, the fraction of kids who become inventors versus third grade math test scores again, but now breaking the data down by race. And you can see that for Asians in blue and whites in uh, orange here, the probability of becoming an inventor really shoots up in the upper tail. But really remarkably for blacks and Hispanics, it's just virtually flat. So the fraction of black kids who are doing very well in their uh, third grade classes who go on to become inventors is extremely close to zero, even though they have as measured by these tests in third grade, basically the same ability, th those kids in that last dot, as the, uh, Hispanic, as, the, as the white and Asian kids, okay? So really substantial differences by race as well, conditional on measures of ability. And similarly, we can look at uh, differences by gender. Here it's interesting to look at the data over time because you can look at a long time series and see how things are changing. And so this chart, is plotting the gender gap in innovation, the fraction of inventors we see in our data who are female by their birth cohort. And so you can see that back in 1940, only something like 4% of patents among people born in 1940, only 4% of patents went to women. And that number has gone up steadily over time to about 15% today. So there's a steady increase, a steady reduction of the gender gap, right? But the rate of increase is incredibly slow. It's about a quarter of a percent per year, which means that it's gonna take another 140 years to get to a 50-50 uh, share in terms of patenting, right? So there's a really substantial gender gap in innovation that is closing at a, at a very slow rate. And so again, you can ask, you know, uh, to what extent might this be explained by differences in ability? And the answer is basically not at all. If you look at the differences in test scores uh, for boys and girls in third grade, the distribution of test scores looks virtually identical. There's no evidence in particular, one of the hypotheses that people have sometimes discussed is maybe there's more variance in the distribution for boys, and so you end up with more boys in the upper tail, but there's no particular evidence of that. I mean, it's a very, very minor effect. If there is one, you explain less than 5% of the gender gap in innovation uh, based on these measures of ability. So, all in all, the test score data suggests that most of the innovation gap across income, race, and gender doesn't really seem to be due to ability differences. Now I'd caution, I don't wanna overstate that conclusion because uh, tests are imperfect measures of ability, right? It's not like we're perfectly assessing your ability as it matters for innovation using these uh, standardized tests. And so if there's some noise in those tests, then it's possible that ability still matters and it's just that we're not capturing ability perfectly with our test score based, uh, with our tests. Moreover, you know, when we think about that pattern of explaining more and more of the gap in innovation as we use tests in later grades, I think that is pretty suggestive that something like environment that affects ability over time is, is what's relevant. But uh, that also, I think, just to be clear, is not completely definitive because it's plausible that latent genetic ability might get better picked up in say eighth grade tests than third grade tests. You, that could be an alternative explanation of the data that I've shown you so far. So I think just based on what we've seen so far, I think there's suggestive evidence that it's not all about ability, but it's not conclusive. So I'm now gonna take a different approach and try to present some evidence more directly showing that environment does in fact seem to matter. And we're gonna study the role of environment in a specific way by returning to the idea of childhood exposure effects, which has been a running theme through all of these uh, lectures. So in particular, we'll ask whether differences in exposure to innovation during childhood might explain the innovation gap that we're seeing between low and high income families. So there are many different ways in which you might be exposed to innovation as a kid. You know, maybe you grew up in a family where there are inventors or, or scientists. Maybe you grew up around scientists in your neighborhood. We're gonna start by analyzing the relationship between children's and parents innovation rates, focusing specifically within the family on whether your own parents are inventors to begin with, and then we'll generalize uh, to other measures. So um, this uh, chart shows you 
uh, the fraction of children who go on to become inventors, just splitting the data into kids whose parents are not inventors and kids whose parents themselves have patents. So there's an incredibly strong uh, intergenerational persistence in the propensity to be an inventor. You're 10 times as likely to be an inventor if uh, your parents were inventors themselves. And this is largely true even conditional on income, right? So this is not just picking up income differences. If you look among kids from rich families, if your parents happen to be inventors versus you know, business, uh, you know, in some other line of business or doctors or something, you're much more likely to be an inventor yourself. So that's consistent with the idea that um, you know, exposure might, might matter, uh, environment might matter, but the correlation between the child's and the parent's propensity to, to patent could also equally well be driven by genetics, right? So the correlation that we've seen in the previous bar chart could be due to genetics or it could be due to environment. I don't think you can say for sure. You know, maybe there uh, is a certain uh, genetic ability that leads you to be a good scientist or a, or a good inventor and that gets passed down and maybe that's why kids of inventors are more likely to be inventors themselves. So dis to distinguish between these two explanations, the genetics explanation and the environment explanation, we're uh, going to take the approach of analyzing the propensity to patent by narrow technology class. We're gonna exploit the fact that patents are classified into very fine technological categories. So to show you how this works, let me give you an example. Um, this here shows you the classification of patents in the computers and communications technology class, uh, category which is further broken into the subcategory of communications. And within that communications category, there are many different techno technological classes. So for example, there's a technological class called pulse or digital communications, and then demodulators, modulators, so forth and so on. Now we classify these technological classes uh, in terms of their distance from each other based on how likely a person is to have patents in two different technological classes. So the idea is that uh, demodulators and modulators, those are relatively close technological classes because uh, a bunch of people have patents both in demodulators and modulators. But if we take you know, demodulators and something in biology, it's very uncommon that you see somebody having a patent in biology and a patent in computers, right? And so you, know, you can see how you can define a quantitative metric of how far apart two technological classes are based on the degree of co-invention uh, across technological classes, okay? So this example just illustrates the fineness uh, by which uh, the, these categories are, are defined. And so what we're gonna now ask is not just whether you're more likely to invent in general if your parents are inventors, but ask in particular, suppose your parents invented in a particular technology class, like let's say your dad had a patent in demodulators are you more likely to have a patent exactly in demodulators or uh, you know, are you equally likely to have a patent in oscillators or something else? And the idea here is you know, it's probably pretty unlikely that you have the demodulator gene and not the oscillator gene. We would think genetics is, are transmitted you know, at a broader level than that. And so if we see this transmission at the very fine technological class level, that's more consistent with the idea of exposure, that you grew up around a certain kind of innovation and less consistent with the idea that this is about genetics. So this chart here shows you how uh, striking the, the pattern is. So this plots the uh, rate of innovation by technological class, where on the x-axis, we have the distance of the technological class in which you innovate relative to your father's or mother's uh, technological class. So zero here me, is basically asking, did you innovate in exactly the same technological class as your dad? What was the rate of innovation in exactly that same technological class? And you can see there's an enormous spike in exactly that class. If you go even one unit away, which as you saw from the previous table is not very different stuff, that probability falls dramatically and then it is a little bit hard to see in the, with the scaling of this chart, but there's a fairly steep decline as you go to you know, slightly different things like telecommunications amplifiers and so forth in this particular example. There's a slight decay as you go further and further away and then it's basically completely flat, very close to zero. So to, you know, to summarize that differently, 
you are more likely to be an inventor when your parents are inventors, and moreover, you're like, more likely to be an inventor in exactly the same field that they were in, in a very, very precise way. Uh, and so that strongly suggests that it's exposure that's driving this relationship and not uh, just kind of general uh, abil differences in ability that are transmitted across generations. Now, parents, of course, are only one potential source of exposure. And from a policy perspective, maybe not the most interesting source of exposure because it's very hard to replicate what parents do, presumably through some policy tool, because that's really a substantial amount of exposure, right? So to capture broader sources of exposure that might be less intensive, we now analyze variation across neighborhoods where the children grew up. So very much parallel to what we were doing when we were looking at earnings and the broader work on intergenerational mobility, but now focusing specifically on innovation. So again, we break down the data by the commuting zone where the child grew up, these 740 metro and rural areas in the US. Uh, and in each of those areas, we take the set of kids who grew up in that area and ask what fraction of them go on to have a patent, all right? And the map here is colored so that redder colors represent kind of the hot spots of generating innovation. Those are the places where more kids go on to become inventors. So I think the patterns are intuitive. You can see, for instance, that in Silicon Valley, you have a lot more kids who grow up to uh, become inventors. In the Northeast, in the tech corridor around Boston, a lot of kids grow up to, to become inventors. There are also some interesting, perhaps surprising patterns. So Detroit, Michigan, which looks terrible in terms of upward mobility in general, actually has a lot of kids who go on to become inventors. Uh, and so we don't know exactly why that is. One hypothesis that Scott Stern suggested to me is that maybe when you grow up around uh, you know, auto manufacturing and a lot of technical work like that, you're through exposure you know, more likely to go into innovation. Uh, another interesting case, you can see the South in general just doesn't look like it produces many inventors. With one exception, what is that? That's Austin, Texas, uh, where the University of Texas Austin is. So the pattern that you can see here is that kids are more likely to grow up to become inventors uh, in the areas where there's a lot of innovation occurring around them already. And so that, uh, you can see that directly in this scatter plot here, which takes the 100 largest CZs, and on the x-axis shows the patent rate for adults who are working in each of those places. So you can see you know, Silicon Valley is up on the far right with the highest uh, rate of innovation. And then on the y-axis, we're plotting the number of kids who grew up in that area who go on to become inventors. And there's a very strong relationship between these two things. If you grow up in an area where there are more inventors, you yourself are more likely to become an inventor in adulthood. Now, once again, that effect could be driven by genetics. It could be that the you know, um, abilities of the kids who are growing up in Silicon Valley are different from the abilities of the kids growing up uh, in the South, for example. There, there are different sets of kids. But again, we are gonna be able to distinguish between that genetics explanation and the exposure explanation by looking at patterns within technological class. And so what we show, uh, just to summarize briefly, is that the exact technology class, exactly like we saw for the parents, the technology class in which a child innovates is strongly related to where he grew up, conditional on that child's location in adulthood. So rather than showing you the details of this statistical analysis, let me just summarize what we find with an example. So let's say we take two kids who currently live in Boston. Let's say two kids who are at MIT. And suppose one of the kids grew up in Silicon Valley, which has a lot of computer innovation. And suppose the other kid grew up in Minneapolis, which happens to have a lot of medical device manufacturers. What we see in the data is that the kid who grew up in Minneapolis is more likely to have a medical device patent and the kid who grew up in the Bay Area is more likely to have a software patent, conditional on both being in Boston at the present time, right? So, and that's true not just across computers and biology, but again, at these very fine technology class levels, which again suggests that this is not about differences in abilities, it's about differences in what happened to be going on around you while you were growing up that influenced your career choices, the investments you made, and so forth and so on. So exposure seems really important. Right, so let me summarize what we find uh, in this study. Uh, with this, so I think the key lesson to take away here uh, 
is that there are substantial gaps in innovation by, by family background, and those are driven primarily, not entirely, but primarily by differences in exposure rather than differences in ability. And that implies that increasing equality of opportunity would actually move towards having more meritocracy. So that is, there are a lot of high ability kids from low income families who could go on to become inventors we're sort of missing out on in the, in the current system. And so by improving equality of opportunity, by giving those kids better resources, more exposure to innovation and so on, we might actually end up increasing efficiency and in GDP growth contrary to the standard equity efficiency trade-off that you know, comes out of certain models, okay? And so then I think the, the key question that emerges given that result is what types of policies might actually help us get more of these low-income kids into the innovation sector so that we can achieve these gains. And so that's what I'm gonna talk about uh, in, the, in the remainder of this lecture. So there are, I think, broadly two policy paradigms that people think about uh, in the context of trying to spark innovation. The first approach is what you might think of as supply-side policies to draw more people into innovation. So think of things like investments to increase exposure, such as gifted and talented programs to guide these smart kids and really give them the resources they need to succeed, or internships at technology firms, for example, for kids from low-income backgrounds. There are various types of investments you might make that try to directly address these resource gaps and try to pull in more people into the innovation sector. Now the traditional concern, I think hesitation about these supply-side policies is that the marginal individual drawn into innovation might produce inventions that are of relatively limited value. In a standard economic model of selection into occupations, a Roy model of selection into occupations, where people are trading off the costs and benefits of going into each of the different occupations that they can select, the, such a model predicts that superstar inventors, think of the Einsteins, uh, they are gonna come through the pipeline regardless of their background. So the, the logic here is, you know, if you're a really a person who's gonna become a fabulous inventor who's gonna have a lot of impact and presumably make a lot of money, then you're not gonna be deterred by, you know, small barriers that might prevent you from uh, going into one sector or another because the payoffs are so enormous that they will outweigh any barriers you face on the margin. That's kind of a standard fixed cost uh, model of uh, selection into occupations. So that type of model is, uh, is put forth in a, in a well-known paper by Chang Tai Shea, Pete Kleenow, Chad Jones, and, and others, uh, which argues that some of these differences in uh, uh, allocation of talent across sectors might be driven by differ differential barriers to entry, which they model as fixed cost of entry, entry into these sectors. Now that type of model predicts that the marginal inventor who you draw into the sector by say an exposure policy or slightly reducing the barriers to entry will not be the Einstein who's gonna have an enormous impact. It's gonna be someone who has an invention that's of marginal value and hence you know, doesn't really contribute greatly to aggregate innovation and aggregate GDP growth. A different way to say that is that such models predict that the average quality of inventors from underrepresented backgrounds uh, under that represent groups, so think of low-income families or black kids or females, the, uh, the, ki the groups that are underrepresented in innovation. These models predict that those underrepresented groups will have higher quality innovations on average because the idea is in these underrepresented groups, like take the low-income kids, uh, in this line of thinking, we've, uh, the, the kids who've gotten excluded are the kids of relatively low ability, the kids who are not gonna have the very high impact innovations. So the ones who are left, who make it through the innovation pipeline are really the superstars. And so what that predicts is that conditional on being low income, the people who make it through are these really talented inventors who are gonna have very high impact innovations on average relative to high income kids where lots of people are going into innovation, including the more marginal guys. So let's see whether that prediction actually holds true in the data. We can evaluate that by comparing the impact of these inventions, again, measured by citations, okay, as one measure of, of impact. Uh, so what we're plotting here is the fraction of inventors uh, 
who end up in the top 5% of the citation distribution, so the fraction of people who go on to have these very highly cited impactful patents. And we're calculating that fraction now conditional on being an inventor for kids from low-income families and high-income families. So we're al always looking at the underrepresented group in the red. So the low-income kids are less likely to become inventors, right, than the high-income kids. Similarly, non-minorities versus minorities and males versus females. So remember that the standard traditional selection model predicts that the smaller set of people who make it into these red groups, they are the superstar types. And so we should expect to see that these red bars would be much above the blue bars in the traditional theory of selection. But in fact, you can see that that's not at all the case in practice. Basically, you know, these two look equal, or if at all, the average kid who goes on to become an inventor from a low-income family has a lower quality patent than the average kid who goes on to become an inventor from, an, from a high-income family. Okay, so to put it differently, inventors from underrepresented groups do not actually have better inventors on average, and so that implies that we must have many lost Einsteins, that is, many children from low-income backgrounds who would produce high-impact high innovations if they were to become inventors. It's not like all the high-impact inventors from low-income backgrounds are already in the sector, and the guys who are left are people who wouldn't produce very valuable inventions. In fact, the, the quality of the inventions looks the same across the two groups. So why is it that we don't find a pattern that's very consistent with the standard, what you'd think from a standard selection model? It's actually perfectly consistent with the importance of exposure effects. It's not that the marginal low-income child is trading off the gains of going into innovation against some higher fixed cost that he faces. I think it's more that these low-income kids just simply don't think about innovation as a career pathway. It doesn't matter if they are very high ability or have the potential to have a highly impactful innovation. If you don't know about innovation as a career pathway and it's not really on your radar screen at all, and you don't know anyone who's ever become a scientist, then you're gonna get this kind of pattern where you have a bunch of kids who would have done extremely well in that sector who just don't go into it because of a lack of exposure. And so the key implication of that logic is that contrary to what you might predict based on a standard selection model, supply side policies that increase exposure could actually have quite substantial effects on aggregate innovation by drawing some really talented people, additional people into the innovation sector who will develop maybe the next iPhone or the next blockbuster drug, et cetera. So that's one paradigm. Let's focus on the supply side, focus on exposure, and try to draw more people into innovation. A different paradigm, what I would say actually receives more attention traditionally in discussions of innovation, is what you might think of as demand side policies that try to incentivize innovation. Uh, and so you know, where you see this the most, I think, is substantial policy discussion in the US and other countries about cutting, for instance, top income tax rates to spark more innovation. The idea here being that when we have very high top tax rates, people are deterred from putting in a lot of effort to try to come up with big uh, inventions or start new companies that are gonna have big payoffs. And so the logic uh, is to try to you know, uh, align incentives better and try to get people to exert more effort to get these high incomes and increase innovation through that approach. I think the data, while we don't have you know, direct evidence on the effect of taxes on innovation in this paper, the broadly, broadly speaking, the data we're showing here seem less supportive of this approach for two reasons. First, changing tax rates is unlikely to have substantial effects if the key determinant of innovation is exposure. So if the key thing that's determining whether somebody goes into the innovation sector or not is not this marginal trade-off that we usually think about in economic analysis where you're weighing the costs and benefits, but rather whether you know about the sector at all or not, then that would suggest that by changing tax rates, you're not gonna have any impact on that exposure margin. And hence, or you know, maybe not gonna generate a big elasticity that would get a lot more people into the sector. Moreover, even if you have some response on the margin, some people who are paying attention to, to tax rates and costs and benefits, the tremendous skewness of the payoffs to innovation limits, I think, the scope of top tax rates to have a substantial impact on rates of innovation. So just to uh, illustrate that, um, here we're plotting the income distribution of people 
who have patents, okay? So this is the distribution of inventors' mean income between the ages of 40 and 50. So we're taking an average over about a 10-year period, and we're plotting the average annual income of these people who have patents. And you can see that this distribution is incredibly skewed, right? Where the median income of these inventors is only about is $115,000. So it's relatively high income relative to the income distribution as a whole, but it's not incredibly high, right? But if you look at the top, uh, the cutoff for being in the top 1% of this group, it's $1.6 million per year on average over a decade, right? So you're making $16 million over that decade. And so basically the, the way to think about this is a very small fraction of people, like one in 100 people, make an enormous amount of money when they have a patent. And the vast majority of people make very little, an amount that would not be affected by top income tax rates. So now in that context, think about what cutting the top tax rate would do. Okay, so to simplify this, suppose if your invention is successful, one in 100 chance, you make a million dollars. And suppose 99 in 100 chance, you make $50,000 or you make essentially, let's say, zero. So now, suppose I cut top income tax rates. In the state where my invention is not successful, because I'm not in the top tax bracket, that doesn't affect my payoff at all. And in the state where I am successful, I'm making a million dollars, and now maybe if you put a 10% tax on me, I'm making $900,000 instead per year. So it's hard to imagine, I think intuitively, that a lot of people would reason that, you know, I'm not gonna go into innovation because if I have this company that's incredibly successful, I'm only gonna make 900,000 a year instead of 1 million a year, right? And so, you know, following that logic, to put it more precisely, when you have such a skewed payoff structure with plausible parameters, in a simple calibration, it's very hard to generate high elasticities of entry into the innovation sector uh, with respect to top income tax rates, okay? Uh, so, you know, when, basically when you have an adequate amount of diminishing marginal utility, because the top tax rate affects payoffs only when the invention succeeds, you're unlikely to affect the decision to innovate significantly. So putting this together to summarize, uh, I think these data suggest that supply side policies to increase innovation have more promise than the traditional approach of changing incentives. In fact, you might think about combining these two things and conclude that it may be desirable to increase top income tax rates in order to finance programs that draw more low income children into innovation by providing internships or specialized programs in schools and so forth. More broadly, while this is a specific lesson, you know, in the context of this set of policies, I think this illustrates that policies that improve equality of opportunity can increase the rate of innovation and um, ultimately increase the rate of economic growth, suggesting that there isn't necessarily a hard trade-off between equality of opportunity and growth. And in fact, you know, even from an aggregate perspective, we might want to increase uh, equality of opportunity to improve both the outcomes of the poor and potentially the outcomes of higher income people uh, in a country. So let me now just take a couple of minutes to conclude you know, more broadly from these th three lectures. What are some of the big picture takeaway messages that, that I'd like you to go home with? First, uh, I think a lot of the data we've looked at suggests that when we think about problems of inequality and, and opportunity, we should be thinking at a local and not just a national level. So usually conversations about inequality occur at the national level. So the idea of the American dream, that term itself implies that it's an American problem. But really what we see in the data is that it's much more of a local problem. The you know, San Francisco dream versus the Atlanta dream. The, the, the situation seems very different across uh, small places and that suggests a very different set of policies. I think it's also an encouraging message because it suggests that the problem is tractable, that we can actually do something in local communities to have a meaningful impact on opportunity. Second, I think another broad theme that emerges is that we should be focusing on improving childhood environment in particular at all ages, not just the earliest ages, because that has an impact both on children's own success and on rates of innovation, so forth and so on. So rather than concentrating purely on the labor market, uh, as I think a lot of uh, the discussion on inequality and opportunity does, I think thinking about the childhood environment is also quite important. And then third, at, at a broader level, as I hope I've illustrated in these lectures, I think harnessing big data or administrative data to evaluate 
policies scientifically and measure local progress and performance can be extremely valuable. In the US, we're working with government agencies uh, to create a system to monitor local trends in inequality and opportunity, basically having the IRS systematically produce statistics of the type I've been showing you here so that local communities can monitor how they're doing and see which policies work and which policies don't seem to work. We've, we've also made all of the data that I've been showing you in these talks publicly available on this website, equalityofopportunity.org, where you can just go and download by county and by commuting zone what you know, these statistics on rates of upward mobility and so forth. And we're hoping that as we accumulate this data over time, researchers will be able to use these data to study the impacts of local policy changes and so on. So let me end by coming back to the statistics that I started out with in the very first slide uh, in the first lecture, which are your odds of rising from the bottom fifth to the top fifth of the income distribution. So I think you can look at these types of statistics in two ways. One is a pessimistic interpretation is to focus on the fact that the average level of upward mobility in the US or the UK is only around seven and a half or, or nine percent, doesn't seem all that high. Uh, and you know, isn't it unfortunate that in fact the US doesn't seem to be really a land of opportunity. I take a more optimistic view. I think these data present an opportunity and a challenge. I think the opportunity is illustrated by the fact that there are places in the United States like the Bay Area or Dubuque, Iowa, which has a remarkably high rate of bottom to top upward mobility of 18%. And that I think presents an opportunity because it shows us that there are ways within the context of, of the United States to potentially increase rates of opportunity quite substantially. I think the challenge is for us as researchers to figure out exactly what's driving these differences in upward mobility across areas, and the challenge for those here interested in policy is to act upon those solutions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Raj, and uh, so time for some questions. Um, so hands in the air, and we have some people with microphones. So yeah, they're at the back. I think you have to wait for a, a microphone. Um, what would, oh, oh yeah. Um, what would you think is the single best thing to do to improve inequality then? Or reduce inequality, I should say, sorry. <laughs> the single best uh, thing to do. So I, uh, you know, that's hard to say because there are a variety of different policies we talked about that I think can have significant impacts. If you had to choose between them, given the amount we're already doing in the context of education and so forth, I think I would try to focus on integration, so trying to reduce the growing segregation that you see in many uh, cities as high-income families are living in different areas from low-income families, because I think that will affect exposure in a variety of different ways. So kids from low-income families, in the context of this lecture, are more likely to be exposed to innovation, say, you know, from their neighbors. In the context of the previous lectures, they're more likely to be exposed to other career pathways that might improve their earnings. I choose that one not because I think it necessarily has the highest levels of returns, but because I think it's the area where currently in the policy debate we probably spend the least attention relative to things like education where there is a lot of focus. Uh, yeah, there at the back. Yeah. Um, do, would you say that that um, reflects into corporations as well? So kind of lower income or lower earning businesses, so the charity sector, for example, do you think the charity sector working more with higher earning corporations would have an effect on that as well? Uh, yeah, so I could see corporations playing a significant role. So for example, you know, in the context of what we're talking about here in this lecture, uh, if corporations like in Silicon Valley were to offer more internships or more access to kids from uh, lower income or underrepresented backgrounds, which could be funded by charities or by government or by themselves, uh, I think that could have quite a significant impact on what those children choose to do. And so, you know, one of the things we've been discussing with tech firms in, in the Bay Area is how you might expand such programs. You know, for instance, 
identifying the kids who are doing really well in school as judged by these math tests in third grade, which appear to be pretty predictive of ability for, for later success and maybe taking those kids and bringing them in for specialized programs that will uh, give them the exposure that really seems to matter. Uh, yeah, back there. Enjoyed the lecture very much indeed. Can you just say something a little bit more about patents? As you mentioned, patents may not be the best measure of innovation. Maybe the results that you're getting are just a bit misleading. Maybe what these kids are doing are writing movie scripts, you know, writing software, doing yep. music, all of, the, all of which mm -hmm. can't be patented. Right. And I wonder whether you might get, therefore, a biased picture from right. the study that you've done. Yeah, so I think you know, that's possible. So certainly patents are not a measure of all economic activity and certainly not all creative economic activity. Um, I, while I think that could be going on, my instinct is that that's probably not what it is for two reasons. So first, given the very specific exposure pathway that we saw, that it's not just generally that you're more likely to be an inventor if you're you know, in an area with a lot of innovation or in a family that's more likely to be uh, innovating, it's that you pursue a very specific line, uh, exactly that technology class. That mechanism seems a little bit, you know, unless you think the kids in the low-income families are being exposed to other forms of uh, crea you know, creative activity like writing scripts, et cetera, uh, which I think you know, empirically seems less plausible, um, you, you wouldn't expect to see you know, that explaining the, the gaps in innovation that we're seeing. Uh, given the exposure pathway. But maybe you know, more directly, another piece of evidence which I didn't show here is that we see that most of the gap in innovation is explained, for instance, by which college you attend. So by, it's not that you're choosing different careers once you're in the labor market. By the time you're in college, you're on a completely different track if you're from a low-income family relative to a high-income family. So to put it differently, you know, conditional on attending a college like Harvard or Stanford, if it were true that the kids from low-income families just pursue other careers that are you know, equally innovative but just don't result in a patent, then uh, you might expect to see that that gap in innovation by income continues to remain uh, quite strong. In fact, that, that, that gradient turns almost flat. Conditional on the college you attend, parent income is not very predictive of whether you go on to have a patent, which suggests that the mechanism is more, you know, do you get to Harvard, do you get to MIT, uh, and that really varies by the child's income, and that's consistent with exposure, et cetera, mattering, and not so much the mismeasurement hypothesis, I think. Yeah, up there, upstairs. Oh, um, my question was around um, your wider conclusion about the importance of big data sets um, in policy making, and coming from the policy world, big data is very much the hype. Um, everyone's trying to do big data, but what that often leads to is politicians um, having their political cycles and therefore incorrectly using big data um, and not uh, allowing for sufficient time for some of these effects that you've shown mm -hmm. to take part in drawing the incorrect policy conclusions. What's your feeling around the type of infrastructure that needs to be established to enable these type of big data sets to be used correctly mm -hmm. um, and to draw on the right type of policy interventions? Well, I think one thing that would be useful is making these types of data more widely available so that people in the research community can access them more systematically and also be able to replicate the results that other people are generating. So the easiest way to verify whether a result really seems to be robust is to have it replicated by other researchers. And when you have a system, as is the case in most developed countries, where these types of data are very hard to access, that both limits the number of high quality people who can work with the data uh, and it makes replication very difficult. And so the evidence that's not so good as you put it, that's not really solid, is harder to weed out if nobody else can do the same analysis. And so I think availability of data is one obvious way in which we might be able to get better evidence uh, out of these data sets. Let's take a few more questions. We have uh, one there at the front and then one at the back and then one over there. Let's start at the front there, maybe. So you talked yesterday about family stability, and I wondered if I could link that to this lecture by saying, are there any, or is there a sufficient sample of people whose fathers are big inventors, 
but whose family split up. Because we know that in most mm. cases of splits, the child spends the overwhelming majority of their time with the mother. Yes. So they still have the same genetic inheritance, but they won't have the same sort of day-to-day -day influence of a dad who invents modulators. Yes. And so my question would be twofold. Firstly, do those children invent just as much as if the parents have stayed together? Mm. And secondly, if they do, in conditional on inventing, are they less likely to invent the same thing as their mm. dad? Yep, very good question. I, uh, in principle, I think could be studied. We, we haven't done it. Um, <laughs> but it's a good idea. We'll keep it in mind. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation. So I have two questions. One, uh, going back to the previous lecture, when I was thinking back, uh, you talked about the benefits of uh, the places which have more mixed neighborhoods, like mixed racial neighborhoods. Uh, there is higher propensity of uh, future higher income for children. So I was thinking uh, there is a lot of literature on how uh, when immigrants come in, it's actually beneficial for them to go to the neighborhoods which is concentrated around their racial or ethnic lines because they can settle in and they get help from other people. So what are the actual reasoning underlying mm -hmm. that when it's a mixed neighborhood, it's better for people for future yeah. earnings? Mm -hmm. And the second question I have is more, uh, when you talk, say it's more the method methodological question, in the sense when you talk about where children gr uh, grew up and you show us the heat map, um, does that include the children who grew up in a certain state but then moved to a university in a different state? And how that impacts the exposure? Because exposure can be from their family or from the university or the, I don't know, school where they're attending in a different location. So how does the heat map change in that sense? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So uh, let me start with the first question on diversity. So you're absolutely right that empirically the pattern you see is that immigrant families tend to move to areas with a lot of people from the same country exactly because the view is that you have more support there and so forth. So that kind of cuts the opposite way that you want to be in a sense in a less diverse place. I think what's driving the segregation patterns is less racial segregation, which I showed you because it turns out to be easier to measure and is the standard measure of segregation that many people use, uh, but rather income segregation. So places that are more segregated by race also tend to be more segregated by income, meaning the rich and the poor are living in worse places. And so while I think it's plausible that you know, maybe for linguistic or cultural reasons, being around people from a similar country or similar racial background might be beneficial. Really, I think what's driving the segregation patterns that I was showing you here is income segregation. So what we see in a place like Atlanta, which has a lot of racial segregation between blacks and whites, is that it also has a lot of income segregation. The poor people are living in different areas than white people, uh, than, than, um, than, than rich people. and so. One consequence of that is that uh, low-income blacks and whites in Atlanta have much worse outcomes, much lower opportunities for upward mobility than low-income blacks and whites in a place like Sacramento, for example, which is more integrated. And so, you know, what I think that evidence addresses is that it's not really racial segregation that's the crucial thing, also, although that also could matter, but it's really about concentrated poverty. Living in a place like the Martin Luther King Towers, the public housing project we were talking about, where everyone has relatively low income and you may not be aware of the opportunities, you may not have the aspirations that you would have if you lived somewhere else. Okay, so I think the two things can actually be compatible for that reason because of the difference between race and income. On um, your second question of how are we classifying people? Yes, we're classifying people based on where they grew up, where they were children, or think of it as where they were born, rather than where they live as adults. And what we find based on the evidence of looking at people who move is that it's really about your childhood exposure. So moving to a place where there's a university when you're an adult doesn't necessarily change your trajectory. It might be an outcome that you move to a place like Silicon Valley if you've chosen to pursue a career path that leads to innovation, right? So you will see a lot of people who are inventors move to a place like Silicon Valley, but the key determinant in terms of causal effects based on everything I've been showing you in these lectures appears to be where you're growing up, not where you're living as an adult in terms of what's driving your decision to become an inventor. Okay, so last two questions. We had you at the back and then you on the balcony and, and then we'll stop. All right, uh, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, so I'm originally from Kansas. Um, and so my first question is, um, what do you think about educational vouchers? Because uh, 
Um, like from for me, I live in Johnson County, which tends to be a very like affluent community, and the schools tend to be really good around there. Um, and 20 minutes away in downtown Kansas City, in the past few years, uh, many students who tend to be, you know, of the African American um, poor uh, back like status, uh, they didn't really they don't really have access to good education. So my first question is, what do you think about? Uh, like maybe emphasizing more educational vouchers or how we can make that like a more prevalent, I guess, thought about thought about and implemented in society. And then my second question is, um, what do you think about as far as education specializing beforehand, which would give maybe these poor uh, people more opportunities so they, they can like, for example, study how uh, like study technology um, and study like you know like the STEM uh, mm -hmm. whole STEM program study that beforehand so that you know while they're going throughout school you know they're they have like a background in something that's tech like more useful in society not to say that you know like mm -hmm. broader education and all all those things aren't useful um, but at least they have a background um, in something to where uh, you know they in the future they won't have like a lax or a lapse, uh, or I, I think basically what I'm just saying like they won't be left behind right. in some way. Yeah, so on the vouchers issue, I think vouchers can potentially be productive, but there are two important issues to keep in mind. So first is making sure that people make good choices when they're able to choose which school to go to. So I mentioned in the last lecture, this paper by uh, Justine Hastings, showing that when families were given the option to choose schools in North Carolina, and there was some information disclosed on which schools seem to be better as measured by test scores. High income families appeared to make really good decisions and take advantage of that data, and lower income families did not actually act on that. So it's not clear just simply introducing a system of vouchers is gonna get the right people to the right places. I think you need more support than, than simply having vouchers. A second important concern is cream skimming. So the kids who end up moving to the better schools they leave the schools that they were in perhaps in, in worse shape, right? So that you end up with a selected subset of kids who are maybe less motivated or not doing as well, and you also lose resources in those schools. And so that could end up amplifying inequality by making those inner city schools in, in Kansas City even, even worse, right? And so it's not totally obvious that you'll actually improve, uh, you, that you'll reduce inequality through that mechanism. So I think vouchers can be helpful, but that policy needs to be implemented very carefully to achieve uh, better outcomes. Your second question is basically about vocational education is one way I'd think about it. Uh, I think vocational education can make sense. So you could see like in the context of innovation here that some sort of tracking seems beneficial, right? You identify these kids who are at the top of their math class. They seem like they could potentially be pretty good in mentors. Maybe we should put them in the types of classes that will give them the right exposure and the right resources to go down that path. Again, though, I think there's a trade-off that you don't want to put people in a box too quickly because um, ability does fluctuate. It's malleable. And test scores in particular can fluctuate, right? So you see some kids who didn't do so well in third grade do, but they're doing extremely well in fourth grade. And you wouldn't want to just set them off on a totally different track and never give them a chance again. So I think providing these, the way I think about it is providing the opportunity for that sort of specific or vocational education is valuable so that the kids who want to take advantage even in these lower income school districts can do so. But you know, really doing very forcible tracking at a young age might not be as desirable. Yep. Uh, thanks for the lecture series. I have attended the uh, three lectures and I have learned a great deal from you. Uh, truly insightful. Uh, in your concluding slide, you have shared that uh, the social mobility is not just a national problem, but also local. But to me, it is also as much a global problem because uh, the uh, different countries have a uh, different upward mobility. And uh, you perhaps may have not done anything uh, on the global scale, but would like to hear your thought on the you know, global outward mobility, yeah. how, how we could improve that uh, disparity in wealth between nations. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're quite right that these issues are global issues as well. Beyond you know, looking, doing an analysis like this in each country and asking what you can do in other countries, some of you know, which some of the things you might do might be similar to what the lessons we're getting from the US. Maybe you'd want to do a different set of interventions, particularly in developing countries, which face you know, a unique set of challenges. Uh, 
Uh, but beyond that, I think from a global perspective, we should also think about migration across countries, right? So when we think about upward mobility on a global scale, often the way you achieve upward mobility uh, for people in low-income countries is by emigrating to a place like the UK or the US. And so I think immigration plays a key role in thinking about upward mobility at a global level. And at a global level, I think there's actually a more positive message in terms of inequality and opportunity, which is certainly at a global level, inequality has been falling over time, right? As extreme poverty has fallen in large developing countries. Uh, and so I think, you know, one wants to think about similar policy solutions maybe within each of these countries, but also for people interested in uh, the American dream or having immigrants who really contribute to society in uh, more advanced countries, thinking about the global picture in the context of immigration uh, is extremely important and thinking about upward mobility in this broader way, not just within a country, but across countries, I think is a useful angle. So I think there's more to be studied on, on all of those dimensions. Okay, so thank you. So as much as we would like to keep this discussion going on for the entire night with Raj, I think it's uh, time to say thank you to Raj for uh, three very uh, stimulating uh, lectures. Um, social mobility is, of course, a classic question in the social sciences, but Raj and his co-authors um, have been able to shed new light on this classic question by attacking these uh, large administrative uh, data sets. Having listened to these lectures, one of the things that, um, that strikes me the most is how Raj is able to make the analysis and the results seem so clear and simple, although I know that it takes an enormous amount of uh, effort, attention to detail, skill, to produce the kind of clean evidence we've seen based on these administrative uh, data sets. So I think producing insightful research on a complex question and making, making it look easy is a very hard thing to do. And so I want to thank Raj for that and for these three lectures. Thanks, Raj. Thank